Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Raw Talk. This is my new friend, Chris Tompkins. Um, hi, Chris. Hi. Good morning. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I am so excited. We just had the most amazing conversation. And um, oh my gosh, I can't wait to share you with the world uh, oh. because you are a force to be reckoned with in um, all of your teachings. So guys, what I just learned about um, Chris is he is a life coach, a teacher, and a public speaker. Um, he did a TED talk that blew me away. Um, he's like the real deal. He's authentic. Um, and he really has um, a lot to, to teach us. And I am super excited. So, um, Oh my gosh, where do I start? So first of all, you, okay, so um, first you're gay, you, you're gay, you live in LA, and you have written a book, and you became a life coach and a teacher. So the first, what I kind of want to ask is, what was your experience as a kid? Like, when did you know you were gay? And was your experience coming out? Like, was it traumatizing? Or was it like, you know, received? Mm. What was that like? Yeah. Yeah, no, well, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. And we did have an amazing conversation. So I'm, I'm glad that kind of infused the energy. And so um, I'm from Arizona originally. So I've been living in Los Angeles since 2012. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was born and raised in Tucson. And I knew I was gay when I was about six years old was when I kind of had that awareness that there was something you know, at, at a young age, you don't really know necessarily about sexuality, um, though you do know about yourself. And so you're starting to kind of pick up messages. And so I grew up in a pretty religious household. So the messages that I received were that being gay is not okay. And so um, I thought I could pray the gay away. And so I spent pretty much the majority of my childhood doing that, you know, trying to be the best kid I could be, because then you know, my notion of, of God was that if I was good, then God wouldn't be mad at me. And so I try to be really good. Um, and so then, uh, you know, um, I did all the things that I thought straight guys do. I had girlfriends. Um, I, went, I went to college. I was in a fraternity, you know. And so when you're younger, you know, especially in college for me, it was really easy for me to just whatever you're interested in, it's just there, you know, and meaning like, I didn't have to pursue anything necessarily. It was just your, you know, I was in a fraternity and so, you know, parties and social events. Um, but then after college was when it was really difficult because people started to ask me like, well, when are you gonna get married? Why don't you have a girlfriend? And that question was like nails on a chalkboard for me because it was the very thing I was running from. Um, yeah. So hearing that question was a constant reminder. So, I came out, um, I, I moved to Mexico. I've lived in Mexico for two years after I graduated college and um, I met someone. Um, I can tell you my whole coming out story, but that's like a separate, you know, maybe conversation. But um, I came out and after that, it was, it was pretty much conversations with family members. Um, and I was still living in Mexico. I flew home for the holidays and basically it was like lunch with uncle, dinner with cousin, lunch with sister dinner with you know and so um so you, yeah, you have to kind of like individually tell them yeah yeah and everyone has a different you know experience for me i needed to have a conversation because i needed to like see your face and your reaction um because that meant something to me and so um i had those conversations and some of the reactions weren't you know supportive some were mm -hmm. um and it, it was a journey for sure. It was a journey, um, you know, my coming out process, it's kind of like, it, it is a journey. I don't think you come out once and then it's like, did that. Right, um, right, because right. then, you know, down the road, you may bump up against something like, mm -hmm. oh, we're revisiting. So yeah. Right, I was gonna ask you, what was the religion, if it's okay if I ask? That you sure. So I was raised in a non-denominational Christian background but my mom was raised catholic all her life and my dad was raised southern baptist so although they converted to christianity those religious doctrine infused yeah, <laughs> so although i was raised christian i definitely experienced the catholic guilt and the southern baptist dogma <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> for sure oh, wow. 
yeah. like a triple a triple uh, doozy there. Right, 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 right. The religions intertwined. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah. And the reason I ask about religion is because I know that people will be able to relate to this because everybody, you know, I, I come from Utah where there's a lot of Mormons and, and just religion seems to, you know, I mean, it just seems to mess with people sometimes and I'm not dissing on it or anything like that, but it just seems that like a lot of people that I've talked to, a lot of people that have issues, a lot of people that go into drugs and alcohol and stuff like that, their religion is really like a huge part of that guilt and that shame. Mm. And I'm supposed to be this way. And I was taught this way. And you know, um, it just seems to really torment people. And I don't know where to go with that, or I'm just saying it out loud um, because I just know for me growing up in Utah with that Mormon thing was a weird thing to grow up around. It just felt yeah. really unnatural to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so did you, I'm curious about going to Mexico. Did you go to Mexico just to kind of like, were you on a soul searching thing or were you in school? What was the trip? For? Yeah, no, well, you know, I think life, <laughs> life, life, I, I definitely have believe in a higher power and I think that our life calls us, you know, and takes us on journeys. And I went there, I moved there for a job. It was a job. It was with a North American company. Um, and so I worked for, uh, it was a corrugated box plant. So we did corrugated uh, packages or boxes, you know, for like big products like televisions or TVs that we made those boxes, but I worked in the marketing department because that's what my, I studied in college. And so I worked for, it was an American, North American company, but we did all the, um, the sales trainings. So to ensure that customers were, were receiving the same type of experience, whether it was from a, a Mexican salesperson or North American salesperson. Um, so that's where I worked. Um, little did I know though, my life was really, I don't know if I would have come out had I not lived in Mexico because I was away from everything that I knew. I was away from my friends, my family. I had to learn a new language. I had to learn new friends. And so it was really, so to answer your question about a soul searching, it very much was a soul searching okay. um, packaged in a job. <laughs> right. Just something that you weren't aware of, that you no. were soul searching. You would be doing some, some deep digging in there that's that's amazing isn't that interesting how like yeah it was like my life knew that i wouldn't have felt comfortable to explore parts of myself that i felt very i mean i was so i mean i trained i i when i i go to schools and and share my coming out story and so when i tell when i talk to kids i tell them i could have won an oscar for the role that i played as a straight person mm -hmm. and so living in the united states i was like okay this is how straight guys dress in a fraternity, this is how straight guys wear their hats. This is, you know, how they wear. And so when I moved to Mexico, all of that kind of just fell away. And I was able to kind of just ease into myself. And then that's where the discovery came, you know. I mean, I knew I was gay, but I, I was able to catch up with, 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 with what I knew. Right. And just being plucked out of your environment and just not having that to distract you. You were able to just almost like take a deep breath and just be and just, yeah. just like settle into that yeah. skin and go, okay, this is good. This is comfortable. Yeah. Now I'm comfortable to like go back to the States and, and yeah. you know, speak my truth. And, yeah. You know, yeah. I met, yeah, I met a, I met a, I met, I mean, I was young. I was, I think 22. I, I met a boy and like, he picked me up for my, you know, like we did, I did all the things that you do when you're young and are on that like dating process. But like, I, I fell in love. He, he courted me like, you know, all of those things that I would not have felt safe in doing, um, in, in, you know, right. in the United States. So you were able to have that first experience and just, and get that, just get comfortable in that experience. I mean, it prepared you to come back to the States and, you know, and do what you had to do with your family and your friends and, you right. know, probably emotionally, all of it prepared you emotionally yeah. of just, Okay, and gave you the courage, you know. And yeah. That. Yeah, it was because you know, I and mean, not to sound cheesy, but um, the 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 courage you just said courage. The courage that I had to come out was because of love. I fell in love, and I wanted to. I had the same experience that I had heard about people have. I remember I was in the. I was. I remember when I was driving the car, and I heard a song on the radio that had, it was like an old song, like a Celine Dion song or something. 
that I had heard tons of times before, but I listened, I heard the lyrics in a different way because now I knew what that love was. I knew what they were singing about. Whereas before I didn't know, I just heard, it was a song. And so for me, I wanted to stand on a mountaintop and like people do when they fall in love. So that's the courage that I was able to come out to my family, but I didn't have that courage before. Um, so that's, you know, I was in the closet for a long time. Wow, that's amazing. Um... Thank you for sharing that because I think that that's that's um, you know we've come a long way in 2020, yes. but you know we've had these conversations of we still need to keep you know keep the wagon going forward. You know we still need to keep evolving and keep learning and keep kind of stretching outside of that comfort zone and keep pushing pushing forward a little bit. You know so so this gets more comfortable for people so we can coexist and um, you know maybe be a little kinder to one another. Um, okay, so obviously, you know, obviously this kind of led you into this life coaching thing. I mean, what, what kind of pushed you into that? How did, how did that evolve? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that for me, um, and this is why I'm so grateful to be having these conversations is because we've come a long way and there's still work to do. And what I mean by that is um, the inner work. You know, I consider myself an LGBTQ inner advocate because after I came out of the closet, I immersed myself in the external advocacy work. You know, I moved to LA and I started, you know, I, I volunteered and, and was working with all of these really wonderful organizations. And I was still seeing and experiencing in my own life that inner conflict. Um, those inner messages, I call them messages from the playground, because I didn't realize that at the time I didn't have the language to understand that we all play on the same playground, meaning that we all pick up the same societal messages. And some of those are more dormant, so they may not be in our conscious awareness, but they're in our subconscious mind. And our subconscious is what informs how we feel and how we kind of perceive, you know, the world. And so I was still feeling this sense of inner conflict, you know, with myself. And, and, and I used to blame myself and I realized like, oh, well, I played on the same playground as you did. And so I received those messages myself. And so for me, it was about throwing myself into another form of advocacy that took myself deeper into my own life and then wanting to share what I found discovered with others. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think that that's what we're really here for is to learn something ourselves and then to share what we learned, you know, with others. Mm -hmm. and, and what we talked about in the conversation before we went live on this is, you know, you can't transmit what you don't have and you can only take someone as, this is what you said, you can only take someone as far as the depth that you've been willing to go with your own self. Yeah, like, yourself. yeah, for me as an advocate, as an example, like I can only take others as far as I've gone myself. So I could still take someone a certain length of distance. Um, if I want to take them further, that means that I have to go further myself, within myself. And so for me, I saw like, I could really be more impactful as, a, as an advocate, as a friend, as an uncle. I'm an uncle, I have five nieces and nephews. And so that's what I meant by, we've come a long way and there's still work to do. Cause I think that um, there are still things that exist within families that we could go further. And so if I wanted to do that, I needed to do that first. Right. Right. Um, and I agree a hundred percent. And we, we've both been through some very interesting, um, just kind of, you know, both very empathic and, and, um, passionate about just raising awareness, you know, mm -hmm. and, and helping people understand this stuff. Um, so you, you did this Ted talk. So this, so this comes to, um, the playground and you, this is your new book coming out and it's called, um, Raising LGBTQ allies, right? Raising LGBTQ allies, yeah. I printed out a little, I don't know if you could see it, but. Yeah. A I'm cover. It. it hasn't come out yet. You yeah, it's not out yet. It comes out May of 2021, yeah. right? May, May of 2021, yeah. Okay, yeah. so tell me about that book because I love, how, how was the concept born? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's been a journey for sure. Um, so the book really started as a letter that I wrote my family. So back in 2015, I went home to Arizona to visit. And, um, you know, 15 years after I had come out of the closet and my family were in a good place and, and I, was, I was home in, in Tucson and my nephew asked me a question that made me realize oh, there are layers to homophobia. And sometimes homophobia or anything that's fear-based, it is, there's like more surface, kind of like what, um, I went to a lecture one time and the woman who was lecturing spoke about the difference between hot violence and cold violence. And so hot violence is like the more outward, like blatant and obvious, like, you know, verbal, you know, someone kicking their child out of the house because they're, you know, they come out or that's like hot violence. Cold violence is, it's subtle, it's benign, it's, it's in the layers, you know. Um, I work with kids, I teach kids, and so I often, you know, use the analogy of cleaning your room. Like, if your parents walked into your room right now after they asked you to clean it and your dressers, your clothes were folded and put away, your dressers were clean and your room was straightened up, it looks clean, but what if they looked under the bed and saw <laughs> all the stuff that you stuffed underneath the bed? And so I asked my classes, like, like, can you say that your room is clean? Like, is it clean? And so sometimes the kids are like, I don't, like, it's clean on the surface, but then underneath the bed, it's really dirty. And so, so those are the more cold violence forms of homophobia that I'm referring to. That's a great metaphor. And so... So after I, I was in Arizona, I went home to LA and I was like doing all, I remember sitting in my room and just doing all this like research and like trying to help on th them understand like these are conversations that we should be having with our kids like now. So I started to call all my cousins and like different people who I knew who had parents and I was like, you know, have you talked to your kids about, you know, if they have a gay uncle or, you know, about being gay or and everyone, most of the parents that I spoke to said, they're, I, don't, I don't think they're old enough, or I don't know how to have that conversation, or I don't know what to say, or I've thought about it, but I just don't, I don't think they're old enough, you know? And so I ended up writing a letter that I sent to my family, um, to my cousins, my aunt and uncles. Um, and then that letter turned into an article that was first published on the Huffington Post. Um, in 2015 and then it got picked up on different other platforms um, and was republished and then it turned into a presentation that I would drive around LA and give and then that turned into me working at L LA's Central Juvenile Hall um, to work with LGBTQ incarcerated youth oh. and then that led to the TEDx talk and then that led to the book so the book it's been this journey of kind of evolving um, that that's so really, crazy. yeah. You know what? And I love, and I shared this story when we were talking before how um, there was a, you know, a girl, it, it's so true. You, you put a quote on, and it's on your website. Um, it's something, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of it's not what, don't be afraid of what your kids are hearing. Oh, yeah. Don't be afraid of what they're seeing. It's a yeah. quote from somebody, right? Yeah. Roger, Fol Roger Fulgum. It's, yeah, it's my signature on like, my email yeah it's, it's yeah it, and it's so true because we all repeat you know things that we see oh okay you know what i mean it's like my parents well okay don't smoke it's bad for you and they're both smoking so i picked up smoking i mean i did what they did you know what i mean right. so it, it's so interesting um and one of, one of the short stories i was sharing with you is when i was in elementary school there was um there was a girl that was like kind of like a boy you know she just was you know more like a tomboy and I remember noticing her and um I didn't judge it like I just remember not knowing anything about it but knowing that she was different than me you know diff like I dress we dress different and um I just she just seemed more like a boy and I just always liked her and it was more like I was just young observing that and that was it. There was no judgment behind it or anything like that. And I never really learned about that until I look back on that story of what you're saying on the playground. When I read that and I watched your TED talk, I was like, oh my God, I remember my own experiences being on the playground and being little and just noticing right. 
just all the differences in right, the kids, right, you know what I right. mean? And yeah. One of the things I want to say that I want people to know what we talked about is we just talked about being different and the difference. Will you right. elaborate on what we just talked about with that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I love what you just said because I think there are two things that I'd like to share with folks to consider is that you said as a child, you noticed. And there's a difference between judging. You said, I didn't judge, I didn't judge, I noticed. And, and we notice, we do, we, we notice. And so that's what I want really, the, the purpose of this conversation, the book is really to allow parents to understand that they notice things and also their children notice things. And the second thing I'd like to say is to your point about difference versus different is oftentimes when I speak in classrooms or, you know, go to schools and share my coming out story is I'm very mindful of using, because I think language matters and how we talk about things, especially in, in front of children is very important um, because those are the messages from the playground that we carry, you know, and so difference versus different is I'll hear people say, I knew I was different or there's something different about me. And when, when I hear that, I think of the children in the classroom who are listening. And as children at a young age, we want to belong. So I don't want to be different. I want to, I want to be a part of something. And so I encourage the use of difference because difference is something that we all have differences. Differences are important and differences matter. And so I think what we talked about earlier is, is that when we can talk about each other's differences, that actually brings us together. But when I use words like different, that separates us. And it makes, if I'm view, viewing you as different, that means that the stance that I'm taking is superior than you because you're different from me. Mm -hmm. And so- and, and it's such a stigma too. Mm -hmm. Different is, oh, you're different. Like, and this is where I think, mm -hmm you know, kids get depressed and go into suicidal mode. It's like, they're different. They don't quite fit in or they're just, you know, not the same. And it's interesting. I, I had this traumatic event when I was younger because my real name is Raquel. A lot of people know this. I've tried to step into it a million times and it just doesn't fit. I, 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 it freaks me out. Um, it feels too big for me. It's like, oh, Raquel, it's just so like, oh, Raquel Welch. And I was raised, I was named like, you know, it was in that era. I was raised, I was born in 1970. But the long short of it was, in first grade, I remember my teacher saying, Raquel, uh, Rachel, and I had to stand up, all eyes on me. I had to spell my name and I thought, oh my God. And there was like three Kellys in my classroom. And I'm like, you know what, just call me Kelly. It was that moment when I was six years old, I played small. Mm. I felt different. I felt mm -hmm. like I didn't fit in and it made mm -hmm. me feel like a freak. Mm. And, and, and it totally traumatized me. Yeah. And so yeah. I don't want to give up the name because it means the world to me, um, yeah. the name Raquel on many for many reasons mm -hmm. but kelly just seems to fit and it, you know it's that thing that made me feel different that made me feel not enough when i was six years yeah. old I remember that yeah. being a traumatic event yeah no I, I i love that you i mean thank you for sharing that it's mm -hmm. i think it's so it's it's a really good example because i'll share with you is that my first name is john so i go by my full name is john christopher I go by Chris. That's something my father's side of the family, they name their children a first name, but they go by their middle name. Mm -hmm. For the longest time, I mean, I, I just shared with you, I'm in school right now, I'm in grad school. And so even at the first day of class, the teacher, the professor will take attendance and call the name John. And I find myself revert back to that little kid that you just you know, shared that I'm in school and my teacher's calling John and I don't go by John, I don't know John. John feels very, it's, it's not me. And so I don't connect to John. And so I think that that's a good example of how it's really important to understand that our identities are very important to us and they really mean something and they matter. And so when we're called something that we're not, it's like when I'm, if someone calls me John, it's, it, there's no connection to it. Like, Right. Even if someone said, John, John, I wouldn't turn around because I don't, you know, resonate with that. Chris, it's like, Chris, I know myself as Chris. Chris is, you know, it's part of me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that names are kind of like a good analogy to use to talk about who we are on the inside as people. Yes. And why, and why it's important to be able to acknowledge that 
Yeah, absolutely. And that makes me want to dovetail into, um, oh God, don't, don't tell me I'm losing my train of thought. Uh, we talked about this before and it was about, oh, okay. I know what it was. It was about the conversation about gay, right. And, mm -hmm. and the black lives matter and, mm -hmm. and, and that what you see, how did we talk about that? It was in our conversation is if you don't see me as gay, then you don't see me is you don't, if you don't see me as a black person, you don't see me. If you don't see my name like that, um, what's her name that, um, Jane Elliott. Yes. Thank you. Go tell a little bit about that. Cause that's yeah. how we explained the difference of, you know, how we want to be seen. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, I, I shared with you that I remember as a young kid watching uh, Oprah, one of the stories that I share in my book is, um, and I wrote this book in 2019. And so uh, I remember watching a, a Oprah Winfrey episode, like way back when I was like, you know, a teenager or something. And um, she had Jane Elliott on and she was talking about, um, there was Jane Elliott, a young African American man on stage and she stood in front of the audience and she asked the audience, Jane Elliott asked the audience if, if um, they noticed anything different about the two of them. And audience members raised their hand and Jane Elliott was an older white woman and there was a young black man standing next to her taller and people in the audience you know raised their hands and some said oh uh they're they have the height he's taller and so then she looked at him and she said is your height important to you and he said yes she goes would you like to be my height he said no and so then someone else raised their hand and said um gender she goes is being a man important to you he said yes and so she said to the audience no one's saying the c word no one wants to talk about color mm -hmm. and it's you know, when you say, I don't see color, you're saying, I don't see the person. She asked him, is being black important to you? He said, yes. So she says, it's important to acknowledge differences because differences matter. Mm -hmm. And so that's the idea is to acknowledge differences. And so when I, you know, I had a conversation with a friend who said, you know, Chris, you're, you know, you're gay. I don't see you as, as gay. I, you know, it be, your sexuality isn't important to me. And it, it, I understand what he's trying to say, and I also hear that differences outside of the heteronormative kind of dominant, you know, we're socialized in a dominant culture, and so different, you know, my sexuality outside of something that he has to acknowledge mm -hmm. is, what he's, is, is what he's saying. And so I think that that's why parents, it's so important to have conversations with children about differences because mm -hmm. we live in a world with a ton of differences and so when we don't have conversations to acknowledge the differences that children experience on the playground then we're saying that those differences aren't important to us mm -hmm. yeah and i think that you know obviously we were talking about life doesn't happen to us life life, life is happening for us and mm -hmm. and when you when you learn it's really empowering when you have a shift in consciousness and realize that, you know, when something happens, good, bad, or indif like hard stuff, whether it be physical or emotional challenges or whatever, rather to go into victim mode. And we talked about this too, you know, um, it takes a little bit of an awareness to understand this, but rather to go into victim mode and go, why me? And why is it so hard? And you know, I mean, you can take this as fuel and empower yourself and go, okay, um, like I have an autoimmune issue, right? And in rather, I mean, at first I was really pissed about that. I'm like, why is this happening to me? This is crazy. I don't deserve this. But I've learned to lean into it and go, okay, you know what? What is it teaching me? And how can I help others? And how can I learn about this disorder that I have? How did it happen? What am I learning? And how can I help others with it? And uh, just raise awareness, you know? Um, and plus it's autoimmune hepatitis. So, yeah. you know, part of my not enough stuff and part of my story is hepatitis is associated with needles it's associated with sex well you know then i feel this guilt because people go oh my god you, ew cooties you know you've got this hepatitis well it's not that and so i now i just decided you know what i'm not going to be afraid or ashamed that i have this i'm going to say it out loud and i'm going to explain it to people but the fear and the shame was well i'm a recovering drug addict i never use needles but that shame is like oh my god are people going to think that of me and then the other one was, you know, um, I have a little bit of a sexual past, you know what I mean? And, and that I'm good with it, but the shame of people judging me or assuming something that makes me feel like crawling into the hole and, and you know, and, and 
So now I'm just going, you know what? No, I'm not going to, I'm just going to do, I'm going to stand up tall. I'm going to own it. And I'm going to explain it to people and help under, people understand this. Just like you're trying to do with the gay thing. And what we're trying to do with the black lives matter thing is I had to ask my black friends, like, do I call you African American or do I call you black? Well, call me black. I'm black. Oh my God. I never knew that. Right. And, and when you, when you say you don't see color, you're saying you don't see me. Oh my God, I never knew that. So it's like, you know, we when we know better, we do better, mm-hmm. right? When, when yeah. we know better, we do better. And and nobody is doing anything wrong if they're not, you know, if they're not, if they don't know better, they just don't know better, you know? Um, but to, to just, I think just to make a little bit of effort and consciousness and just try to, you don't have to, it's like, we don't have to, all agree and like we have our differences and all those things but we do get to respect each other's choices Mm -hmm. we just get to respect it and that makes the world go around a lot smoother and and a little bit of compassion Mm -hmm. just you know what i don't understand it but do your thing what's wrong with that yeah yeah well i think i mean thank you you said a lot of really good things and i think if i could just add to that is that i think what prevents a lot of us from even having these conversations is that you know i want to see myself as a good person I want to see, you know, parents, you know, caregivers, you know, they want to see themselves as a a good, I'm a good person. I don't, I'm not homophobic. I'm not racist. I'm not, you know, and, and the idea is that when we talked about this too, is that we can only take others as far as we've gone ourselves, meaning that I have to explore these messages from the playground because we all played on the same playground. So if I'm going to sit here and say that I don't carry any of these messages, then that's not really true because I live in a world that has these messages. And so just by virtue of being socialized in a dominant culture. And so the idea with these conversations, you know, if, if we can even engage in them and have them, then we're moving the needle. But oftentimes we resist having these conversations because we don't want to be considered bad or wrong or the things that you talked about is I don't want to be associated with that because it's shameful it's it's you know we talked about the idea of perfection and how it it just is masking shame Mm -hmm. um and so then if we can if we can let go of the need to you know the fear of getting it wrong and even step into that space then we can we can have these conversations um Yeah. Well, and we talked about, you know, you talked about being perfection, uh, being perfectionist means that you care, which I love that. I love that metaphor, you know, being, ner- being nervous, um, at wanting to be a perfectionist. And I also talked about at least my experience with my own perfectionism. Um, and I'm pretty, I'm a pretty sloppy perfectionist, but when I'm not meeting my own expectation, that's where I've gone into a, a depression or like a suicidal thought or whatever, which I don't have anymore, but I'm just using that as an example. And I think a lot of people that have the, that it's gotta be perfect. It's like, you know what? We don't live in a perfect world. You know, none of us do it perfect. All of us are gonna make mistakes. And that is what makes us so awesome, awesomely different. You know, I mean, I don't do these interviews perfect and I don't care because I am not here to be perfect. I don't want people to think I'm perfect. It takes all of that, you know what? I can mess it up and it is okay. Because I'm okay not being perfect. I don't need to be perfect to care about what I'm doing. Um, right. But when it, So I want to go back to um, you, your cause, and I want to go back to the compliment that I gave you. Because, guys, I, I, I watched a lot of Chris's, um, I watched his TED Talk, and you did um, a letter on um, when your friends asked you about golf. And you've you've got some really cool stuff on your blog, but what you, the way you deliver um, in your TED talk, your message, I described it as like a panini. It's very Mm -hmm. easy not to feel defensive or push back. It's very easy to receive the message from you um, and, and like kind of lean into that softness. It's a really soft approach that you have to um, raising awareness. And I, and I, I mean that as such a sincere compliment. Um, it, it makes me want more of what you have. It really truly does. And, and I am willing to be a student of what you're teaching because you have things, uh, you know, you just, I want to learn from you. Um, well, thank you. 
Yeah. I mean, you're, you're just an amazing teacher. You really are uh -huh. a great speaker, an amazing teacher. You, you do it in such a loving way. And we talk about, you know, intention, doing it on purpose, you know, language, all the things like you really think um, it's mind, body, soul of what you put into what you're doing and you, you're born to do it. And um, I just love that because I guess where I want to, you know, some people can just do something for a living and, you know, like, unless you, when you find your truth of what you're, you were meant to be and it gives you passion and makes your heart sing, your heart just blows up with joy, mm -hmm. you know, you're on the right path. And mm -hmm. that's what I see for you. And even when I'm doing this stuff, I just want so much to help people so they don't suffer like yeah. I did or whatever, you know, if we can just raise a little bit, just a little bit and may bring a little more joy into the world. We're doing something good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Wow, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I got these tangents. No, that's no. I, you, but I want to compliment. I appreciate you all. You know, you're that's the most that's a wonderful compliment um, to receive. And I, I received that because I think for a long time I it compliments were really, you know, that I that was some of my work is that, you know, in, to 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 be able to receive, you know, something. So thank you. That's that's very generous. And it's taken a lot of work, you know, to get here. And and um, I think that that's really my 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 hope, you know, with the book too. And and my and ultimately my message is I believe that, you know, we're all on this journey. And the I love the analogy of the hero's journey, the heroine's journey is that, you know, whenever I ask, I talk to, you know, my students about it. And whenever I ask them, you know, well you know, when, when do you think the end of the hero's journey is, you know, and after we've talked about it, you know, they think it's usually like when you fight the battle or when you get the, you know, when you win the, the prize or whatever, but the real end of the journey is when you take what you learned from the journey back to the village and share. And to me, that's what this is really all about. It's all the lessons that I've learned, you know, teaching, um, the work that I've done, um, you know, in Los Angeles and just wanting to share what I've learned and to help others. Um, because I do think that we've come a long way and there's a time and space for really, you know, advocacy where it's like really kind of like out and, and important, you know, having conversations and, you know, demonstrating and that, that comes with, with definitely um, purpose. And there's also really important work to be done in kind of the softer, like conversations that we have in families within ourselves. And I think that sometimes, like if I were to tell parents, like, you're homophobic, like, that's not going to sit well. Right. And so, and so if I do my own work, because really, I just, I just shared this with someone um, I, I mentioned to you, I did a uh, interview the other day and, and I was saying to the person that, you know, when I first wrote this letter, I wrote the letter to my family. Five years later, writing the book, I'm like, oh, this was a letter to me. Mm -hmm. right. and, and so that's really what this work is. And so my hope is that I can help, you know, by having these conversations and, and, kind of dropping down to the more nuanced layers is that if we can do it in like a way that invites, it's an invitation, um, then I think that that's where we can even go further. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it's just amazing the delivery that you are offering because like we were saying, parents want to be this perfect parent and they don't know how to do it. You know, mm -hmm. you, I think I'm not a parent. I was too afraid to be a parent. So my hat's off to all, all the parents out there, but I, I think that most parents are terrified to fail as a parent. Yeah. And so it's like, when do you have that conversation and how do you have that conversation? And if I have this conversation with my kid too soon, is it going to totally screw them up? You know, I just <laughs> therapy, like, how do I, how do I know when, when, and I don't know what kind of resources are out there for parents for that kind of support, but I love the soft approach that you're offering just to prepare kids. Cause you know, we, 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 kids are absorbing everything. I mean, mm -hmm. there's got, you know, that, that softer way to just explain things, um, of love, of 
of everybody's different of healthy boundaries of being kind to people like those are great little messages that I don't remember being taught as a kid do you know what I mean I don't remember having that conversation but um, yeah so I, I just I think that what you're I guess what I'm trying to say is just your approach is soft for parents to at least try on this approach to you know having that conversation with their kids and i can't wait for your book to come out i mean yeah i want to say well, that. yeah well thank you i mean i think that you know one of the things that i i really write about is that um you know when i was a kid there were a lot of things in my life that were going on it, around my in in my family that i intuitively knew no one was having those conversations and so no one was giving me the language as a child to really understand what was going on and so it was very confusing and so then i internalized that confusion and i carried it with me and so i think that my whole and you can insert drug addiction you can insert you know anything that that's going on children know they, they intuitively know, they can pick up on those things. And so as parents, we think that we, they're too young to understand, or if we talk about this, does that mean that it's gonna perpetuate behavior? So we resist having certain conversations. I think that we don't give children enough credit for what they're capable of learning mm -hmm. because they're human, we're human. And I think that if, I was given language to understand more of what was going on, then that would have helped me believe and trust my intuition. Because I already intuitively knew, right. it's just that I wasn't being affirmed for what it was that I already knew. And so then as an adult, a lot of my journey has been relearning how to trust myself. And so that's really my hope is that this book is about raising lgbtq allies and it's also about helping children trust their intuition and to you know you mentioned that, that as, a, as a young person you noticed something about another kid you you noticed that mm -hmm. and so if we can have language to kind of um provide children a container to to contain their noticing then that serves them because then that allows them to trust themselves, that allows them to believe in themselves, that allows them to feel um, comfortable with, with what it is that they perceive in the world. Um, and so ultimately it just helps them be, you know, better humans. <laughs> right. Well, and I think really the, the bottom line to all of this is, you know, there's so much, you go back to the drugs and the depression and all that stuff and, I mean, I truly believe that drugs and depression and all of the, you know, serotonin imbalances come in, you know, PTSD and all that stuff, but most of it comes from trauma and not knowing how to overcome that. But it also comes from being raised in this little box and having to live in that little box and conform. And when, you, when you're over here and your spirit is over here, not being able to live your truth and speak your truth kills you on the inside. Mm -hmm. It just kills your spirit. It's like being in a bad relationship. We've all mm -hmm. been there. Mm -hmm. You're in a bad relationship where you're like, you know what? I may live through this, but my spirit is going to die if I stay mm -hmm. in this relationship. And I've been mm -hmm. in plenty of those. And that's what it is and why people get so depressed and dive into drugs and dive into alcohol and whatever, because they can't live their truth. And so I, that's where I really want to push this envelope and invite people to break free of, of, of that you know um it is not easy to do but it's not easy to live a lie right it's not easy to live a lie you 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 absolutely starve yourself on in, on the inside and you die on the inside right and that's not good for anybody's soul right right um and i know it takes a lot of courage and i know that i'm saying something really big here um but you and i both know how scary it is just to put ourselves out here on zoom and put this thing out in the world for fear of being judged. And it's yeah. like, you know what? It's really scary, but yeah. at the same time, um, we've both been through our share of addiction because yeah. of our pain. You know, yeah. we both have overcome our addiction. We're both, you know, living our truth and we're both pretty, pretty happy 
people. Do we still get scared? Yes. Do we still feel insecure? Yes. Do we still have not enough stuff and we have to go back and nurture that little kid like you talked about? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, you, you talked about just, you know, when you're trying to go forward um, and the things when you go out and speak on, on stage when you did your TED Talk, how you had to go back into your little kid and go, it's a, you know what I mean? Just really kind of nurture that little kid inside of you that's afraid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, that that's really what I hope to share about in anything that I do, whether it's writing, whether it's the book, whether it's speaking, whether it's I teach social emotional learning, you know, whether whatever, is that I think that there's this notion that we get to a certain place and we're done. <laughs> like, I've done all this work, I've arrived and I'm sharing, you know, and that's not who I am. And so I hope that to help, you know, parents understand that, you know, it's, it's okay to get it wrong. Like that's the process of, you know, developing and that's the process of, you know, to be a good enough parent, that's okay, that exists and that's enough. Um, I think that it's when we want to be perfect that we hold on to this like, you know, perfection is like a constricting kind of holding. And so when we can be good enough, it's like a letting go and releasing and allowing. And so I think that for me and my experience, I, I still, I mean, fear, I don't think ever for me, my perspective is that it never, I don't think it goes away. And I think that the idea is that if we can understand that we're going to have fear, especially, especially if we're pursuing our truth, mm -hmm. then it's going to show up. And it's about learning how to help others not be perfect, but to help others be fully themselves, which is human, <laughs> which is, you know, I do believe that we're a soul and that we, you know, are here for a purpose. I also though think that it's really important to acknowledge the humanity of our imperfections and getting it wrong and doing an interview that's not perfectly edited and, you know, maybe saying something wrong. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned in my own life, it's that it's in the repair that growth happens. Um, so ruptures happen all the time, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in conversations, and it's in the repair that we're able to heal. Mm -hmm. So whatever that looks like, whether it's the repair within yourself or your, you know, relationships. Right. Yeah. Wow. This is, you're amazing. <laughs> you're amazing. I'm so grateful that, that the heavens just brought us together. I really uh, am. Um, I, I really want um, to spread the message with your, with your book and your website. I'm, I want to do more work with you. Um, mm. I definitely want to do more work for, with you because I feel like I can learn from you and um, you know, I think the same thing. I think as long as we're here and we have a pulse, we're learning. Mm. And when we're done learning, we're going to die. And that's it. <laughs> when we're done learning what we're supposed to learn when we get here, right. we're not going to be here anymore. So right. as long as we're here on the planet, we are students. Right, right. We are students. Yeah, and we're always evolving. And um, yeah, yeah I, I'm just really grateful. I'm really excited for your book. Um, like, I'm, your, I'm, I'm a champion. Oh, well, thank you. Really thank you. Champion for you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I'm excited about the book. It's been a long time. It's been a, you know, it's, it's a journey. It's, I'm still on the journey, you know, it's, it's been a real process for sure. Um, it's brought up all of my, you know, I think I was telling you that I've really had to revisit some really scary places, you know, in, within myself. And so I've really had to learn how to, to not try and, you know, get rid of those, but to really accept that they're a part of, my like that little kid part of me that's scared and wants to be liked by other people and and so i just have to really kind of allow myself to feel those 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 parts without wanting to like you know get rid of them um and i think that that's really that's really what i think the journey that we're all we're all on is about um and and you touch on that because you know, we were also talking about what you resist persists. And mm. it's like having those crazy thoughts go in your mind. It's like, you know what? Let them come in. It's like traffic. Yeah. Let them yeah. come in. Let yeah. them go. That yeah. fear. You know, like I was telling you, every time I do it, like an interview, I feel like my eye's twitching or my eyes yeah. is shaking or, you know, something's going on with my face and I'm having right. like, oh, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just doing it. I'm going yeah. for it anyway. So whatever. You're, show, you're showing up. We're showing up. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's one of the things too I was going to say is that, um, 
I intentionally, for the book, I broke it up into three different parts. So there are three sections. So there is awareness and then there's willingness and there's change. And so I think that if we're not aware of these thoughts that we have, then we're not going to be able to get to change. We may desire change, but if we're not aware of the things that are going on in our head, if we're not aware of our blind spots, mm -hmm. um, then we're not going to ultimately be able to achieve the change that we, that we really desire. And so I think for anything that we do, I think, you know, we really have to bring the awareness. And then once we have awareness, then just to allow ourselves to have willingness, and then, then that's where we can make change. Right. And we all get to clean out underneath our bed. Yeah, yeah. Right. But if I'm not aware, if I'm not aware right. that it's dirty, right. then how, how am I going to be able to clean it? That's the thing, though, is it can, it can look so great on the surface, but those little, those things that are the bed, you got to lift it out, totally. you got to vacuum it, you know? You get that thing to, you know, get get things tidy and it just makes you feel lighter. Right. You know, because you're working metaphorically from the inside out and you're you're cleansing. So yeah, I I I absolutely love your spirit. So uh thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for spending the time. <laughs> I will um I'll send everybody your information and I can't wait to do more work with you and meet you and um, get a copy of the book. Oh uh, well thank you Kelly. I appreciate being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You bet. I'll see you soon. Okay.